Hello, this is Ian from Ruler, and I've got a favour to ask. This is a call to action from us to you, dear listener. With advertising revenue vastly reduced and newsstand sales non-existent for the magazine, if Ruler is to merge from the current worldwide pandemic, we need a little help. If you're not currently a subscriber, then please join. It costs less than you might think, just £7 a month with our new payment plan. In the unlikely event that you don't like Ruler, cancel after your first issue. Simple as that. Go to ruler.cc forward slash subscribe. And if you're one of the thousands around the world who are already members of Ruler, thank you so much. Please recommend us to a friend, download the app and enjoy free back issues, or visit the Ruler Emporium and buy a gift for a loved one. Everybody loves socks, right? To paraphrase a famous British supermarket chain, every little helps. Thank you for listening. Ruler Long Reads, the finest long-form cycling features and stories from Ruler magazine. Ruler Long Reads is supported by Lacquer Bicycle Insurance. Go to lacquer.co.uk and use the discount code RULER for a £10 credit. Chris Froome has seven Grand Tour wins to his name, including four Tours de France, but a potentially career-ending crash last year sidelined the greatest stage race of his generation for six months. Can he join the five-time Tour Victors Club of Angotil, Merckx, Eno and Ingerain? Ned Bolting meets Froome in Grand Canaria and finds him characteristically bullish mood. But first, a short message from our sponsor. I'm Mark Williamson and I've been a Lacquer customer since the start of 2019, so about eight months now. So I was on this new bike and stopped off at a coffee shop at a hotel just to send a few emails and make a call came out and found someone had taken off um, the headset at the front. They'd cut the braking gear cables, they'd unscrewed the handlebars and stolen the, the, the bars and shifters. Lacquer were phenomenal, actually. I was blown away by both the immediacy and the kind of helpfulness of the support. They seemed keen to help. Uh, and it was just the, a remarkably hassle-free experience. couldn't have been happier with the service despite being incredibly frustrated that somebody had decapitated my uh, my new bike. Chris Froome and the Seventh Circle by Ned Bolting Originally from Ruler issue 20.3 Read by George Oliver One away from a hallowed fifth tour Inside the crash that nearly ended his career and the remarkable mind of a man determined to take a hallowed fifth tour de France this summer against all odds. It's a strange thing. It can change in the blink of an eye. It's a bastard of a sport, isn't it? It is. I love it. I love it. I love that it reveals people's true characters. Does the same apply to you, Chris? It's brought out your true character. 100%. What would that be? I don't crack under pressure. His long ride finished a few hours ago. I'm puzzled because although I've knocked on his door, there's no answer. I think to myself that the rooms must be enormous in this luxury hotel where Ineos have based themselves in Gran Canaria. So I picture him in some distant outpost of his suite, out of earshot, and I knock again, this time louder. Then I notice there's a buzzer and press that too, but still no one comes to the door. This is most unlike Chris Froome, I think. He and I had had a tightly arranged agreement that I would return to his room at seven and we would talk. There are normally no loose ends with him. But just as I was on my way over to his hotel, he messaged me with an apology. He was running behind schedule and suggested I came a quarter of an hour later. Every minute of his day was accounted for, you see. There was no fat, no excess. So now here I am waiting on the seventh floor balcony outside Chris Froome's room, wondering what's going on. It's late January 2020. Almost seven years have passed since Ruler last sent me off to spend time with Froome to try and figure him out. Seven years during which he's managed to amass seven Grand Tour victories, the Velta twice, once retrospectively from his hospital bed, the Giro, his most recent, and the Tour de France, four times. I've taken with me the pages from the previous Ruler edition on this trip to refresh my memory. Rereading the interview on the flight over, I was surprised to note that when the first article appeared in the summer of 2013, Chris Froome could not yet call himself a Grand Tour winner. I'm coming into my prime now, he told me back then. 
For the next seven, possibly eight years, I'll have a realistic chance of going to the tour to fight for yellow. I'd almost forgotten about the time before this all started, after which he'd risen from make-weight domestique to champion-in-waiting with distinct impatience. Everything that followed on from 2011 and 2012 had been so blazingly successful that its glare simply bleached out all that went before. He erased his own past with the luminance of his present. Froome's subsequent assault on the record books was born of some inarticulate hunger. He gorged on success as if he couldn't help himself, as if every grand tour which passed without him winning it were a fatal outrage. Each one of those that slips through my fingers is an opportunity lost, he'd insisted back in 2013, before it all started. Within five years, he'd piled up the victories. How it must have nagged away at him that he'd not picked up the Giro until he finally turned his attention to it that year, through the cloud of a possible ban. That extraordinary victory had been his apotheosis, when he'd held all three Grand Tour titles simultaneously. He's lost them all now, and that Giro win might be his last Grand Tour victory. But it might not. A mysterious crash at the Dauphiné, as yet not fully explicable, has changed everything. So here he is, stuck on number seven. Then I spot him at the end of the corridor, a dozen doors and a hundred metres away, silhouetted against the light and walking towards me, his peculiarly long, bony arm raised in apology. I can tell that he's hurrying on my part. I can also tell by his gait that his body has changed. He walks along with a lurch, unbalanced and awkward. If you're not prepared for how utterly changed his posture is off the bike, it comes as a shock. Sorry I'm late. When we're inside his suite, I tell him what I think. Honestly, you walk like a drunk, Chris. I do, he says. Yeah. And then there's that smiling, polite Froome nod, so familiar to me. He's leafing through the pages of the 2013 Ruler interview and seems fascinated by his own image. You've not changed that much, I tell him. And it's true. He's much the same, at least from the neck up. A bit less hair, he conceded. You hadn't won the tour yet, I offer by way of explanation. Okay, he says, of course. As if that explains the hair thing. I have to say, seeing you train this morning, you still look exactly like Chris Froome on a bike, I continue in a forthright spirit. It's not pretty. Froome laughs. It's funny. A lot of people have told me I look better on a bike since the crash. He looks to me for validation. I didn't see that. I tell him honestly. Oh, thanks, Ned. Can we talk about the crash? He doesn't hesitate. Sure. He shows me some of his scars. There's a big, reddened incision at his right hip, where they sliced through his muscle in order to screw in a plate. When the plate came out in late November, his wound reacted to the dissolvable stitches and became inflamed. Back to hospital, again. And now, two months later, the sight is still not completely right. Small wonder he limps. But that's not even the worst of it. It's when we sit down and he stretches those gangly legs out in front of him that have powered him to victory in all those races that he starts to make clear the violence of his crash. He points at a spot above his right knee, and he raises a finger in the air, six inches above it. That was where part of his femur was. I could see bulges that weren't meant to be there. I could see it wasn't right, he explains in the most matter-of-fact way imaginable. There was something there. It shouldn't be like that. The most noticeable place was 10 centimetres above my knee. I could see the skin was raised. It was pretty obvious that the bone was poking up against the skin. The crash, which changed the course of 2019 and opened the door to a wildly exciting and unpredictable Tour de France, remains a glitch in the matrix, a tear in the space-time continuum of Froome's ascendancy. One minute, he's on the Dauphin ATT course, feeling as if his season is about to start. I was in fantastic form. I was ready to lay it on the road that day. I remember thinking this is perfect for me. Windy conditions, it's going to be a tough TT, nice big climb in the middle. And the next minute? I'm coming into Roanne, I can remember that. But that's about the last memory I have. The rest is blank. I can remember being on the ground and the paramedics arriving. 
I knew I was hurt. I could see straight away from the way my leg was. Froom pauses and then lifts his trouser leg up again. You see that scar there? And there? They're extremely thick and deep looking. These ones have healed properly, but will be there for life, no doubt. Yet they were the unimportant bit of the crash. The flesh wounds of a Monty Python crash. That was a big gash. It was just open and bleeding quite a bit. I imagine that it was the bike that sliced me that caused that. But those weren't the issue. I was more concerned with whatever it was that was poking through my shorts. I could see my leg was in a bad way. I was also complaining about my back. I had fractured a vertebra as well. I was in a lot of pain lying there. I could also see my elbow was broken. It was pointing in a direction it shouldn't have been. In short, it becomes apparent that having lost control, possibly in a gust of wind, possibly because he had one hand off the bars, he slammed into a garden wall and the entire right side of that distinctive tall body took the force of the collision. His TT bike still had the speed from the descent into Rohan. There had been no time for him to react, he conjectures. It just makes no sense. How could it have happened? He shakes his head where he sits, and he looks at me again, as if, by patiently explaining the process out loud, he might stumble across its origins. The logical part of me says that if I was going at 60 kilometres per hour towards a wall, I'd put myself straight onto the tarmac. Instantly, without even thinking. Anywhere but the wall, you put yourself down. He looks again at that partially ruined, partially mending leg. It just makes no sense. To some on the outside, it made so little sense that they concluded it had been faked so that Froome could avoid a doping test. I know that this was being said, and I know that Froome knows that this was being said, and he probably knows that I know that he knows. He brings the conspiracy theories up in conversation, lightly and with a kind of detached amusement. All that stuff at the beginning of my rehab, that the crash didn't even happen or that it was faked, it was just water off a duck's back. He laughs in a manner I haven't often heard from him before. It's not the perfunctory semi-laugh that simply marks an attempt at humour. This is spontaneous, relaxed laugh. Because he actually finds something funny. I was sitting there with broken femur in two places, lots of other broken bones. I was thinking, this definitely doesn't feel fake. What followed in the minutes, hours, months after the accident are chilling, even by the standards of this precious, fragile sport that places its practitioners in such peril. The deep wounds to his leg were one thing, but the punctured lung and internal bleeding were of more immediate concern. At first, perhaps out of habit, perhaps from shock, Froome determinedly played down the severity of his situation, both to himself and to his wife Michelle, whose number Gary Blem, Froome's mechanic, had dialed. She told him she was on her way to be with him. Froome didn't see the need. No, don't worry, I've got the paramedics here, my team are here, just take it easy, stay with the kids, I'll be fine. At that point, he tells me, Gary took the phone off me and told her that she should come. This was serious. Taken first to the small clinic in Rouen, he was then airlifted to Saint-Étienne to a hospital which has admitted so many broken riders over so many years, from the tragic Roger Riviere in 1960 to Chris Froome in 2019. Here, surrounded by a team of clinicians, he started to realise what was happening, how little control he had, and he began to submit to his fate. It was a very strange feeling of dependency. I was completely in the hands of the first responders and the emergency room staff. There was nothing I could say or do. This was out of my hands. I was just lying there as if I were in a movie, just watching all these people working. It was hopelessness. It was a feeling of real hopelessness. They spent seven hours operating. I'd broken my femur in two places. The nastiest one was the one I could physically see. It had splintered the femur into several pieces, so they needed to put that back together and puzzle that out trying to get the fragments back into place and align them. There was another fracture at the top of my femur. They placed a plate with a hook over my hip in there to secure that fracture, and they also put a rod from my hip all the way down to my knee, with screws in both sides to hold everything in place. That's staying in there now. It's in the middle of the bone, so I don't feel that at all. 
it's basically taken the place of the bone marrow. And they also needed to work on my elbow and put screws and wires in there too. In recovery, he never once thought that his career was over. Within an hour of coming round, the surgeons and physiotherapists told him that all of his injuries were, in theory, recoverable, but it would be a long journey back. I spent six weeks just lying flat in a bed, not able to even go to the toilet on my own. Then I made it into a wheelchair, probably for another month and a half. While I was still in a wheelchair, they lifted me up and put me on a turbo trainer so I could ride with my good leg. It was quite an ordeal, manoeuvring myself from the wheelchair onto the bike. Then I transitioned onto crutches. It was a big old process just to get to the winter. Did you watch the Tour de France? I ask, picturing Froome propped up by pillows with a remote control and a bunch of grapes on his bedside table, going quietly insane at the sight of everyone else doing his race. Yes, I watched it as much as I could. When the tour started, I found it difficult. I knew how well I was going and I just really wanted to be there. I was watching the team all rolling out together and thinking I should be there. I should be part of that team. I found that difficult. For a day. Then I got over it. And then I actually quite enjoyed watching. Unexpectedly, since I don't actually ask him for his verdict of his peers, Froome drifts into enthusiastic punditry. He really was watching, it seems, with ever more intent. Then I started to grow quite concerned as the tour went on that neither G nor Egan were leading. Alaphilippe wouldn't let go. Two weeks in, I thought that Pino was going to win. In the Pyrenees, he was riding away from everyone. Dropping Egan, riding away from G. He was looking the strongest. This is true, I think. Pino's confidence and strength are largely forgotten in all the subsequent drama of his sudden abandon. And it's interesting that Froome wants to bring it up. I thought if he carried on like that, Froome continues. He was going to win the race. The one thing that really got me watching the tour was that because neither of our guys were leading, I almost felt more weight on me. I wasn't there. If the team weren't to win, I would have felt pretty bad about that. I would have had quite a big part in that. I tell him that it's good to hear he's finally figured out which is Bardé and which is Pino. In 2013, during our many interviews, both for this magazine and for ITV, he constantly had to stop the recording to check he was talking about the right French rider. Froome laughs loudly at this memory. Another natural easy laugh. I have. I have. I've gotten on to who is who now. And he laughs again for good measure. Okay, so listen. I switch to the future tense. How are you going to win the Tour de France? He exhales loudly. It's going to take a hell of a lot of work. I'm so up for it. I feel as if I might as well have not won anything. I've still got the same hunger, but I've got a new freshness about me. I put to him that he only needs to concentrate on the not insignificant matter of his physical condition. The other big stuff is already assumed. Racecraft, tactics, psychology. He's got all that deeply ingrained. That's it, he agrees. You win the tour in the months before the tour. You don't win the tour during the tour. You win the tour in preparation. That's what it comes down to. I know what to do there. Preparation. There's a pause. I want to ask him about so many things. I want to ask him whether, despite Team Sky's historic brushes with unexplained parcels, shady appointments, occasional sackings, forgetful doctors, dubious TUEs, despite all of that, he can still claim to have done it all clean. But I know what his answer will be. I've heard it so many times before. It seems vacuous to elicit the standard rebuttal from Froome, and I'm not sure what it would achieve. Instead, it's he who brings the subject up, returning to the subject of the conspiracy theorists who flit around his biography. They irk him perhaps more than he's prepared to admit. I've come to accept that cycling comes with a level of scepticism, he says with a rueful smile, as he shuffles uncomfortably around on his couch, sometimes putting his feet up on a coffee table in front of us. It's always been there. It doesn't faze me anymore. This much is true. Having seen his public face harden over a number of years, he does seem to be remarkably impervious to the doubters, whether their arguments are justifiable or a bit crazy. Did it ever faze you? Sure, he nods. Certainly. 
I think back in a flash to a tense press conference in Brittany on the first rest day of the 2013 tour, when, after taking the race lead in the Pyrenees, he was assailed with doping questions from the media. On that day, he'd appeared a bit startled by the intensity of the suspicion. When you're winning the biggest bike race in the world, and basically people are calling you an outright fraud, that's pretty hard-hitting when you know you're doing everything absolutely 100% by the book, going above and beyond to try and do things right. You've never had a meltdown in public, I note. Then I add, yet. It's just not really my style. I'll vent by going out on the bike and trying to put everything out on the road. That's my way of letting off steam. I don't throw a tantrum and scream at people. That's not who I am. In 2013, someone very high up at Team Sky once told me that they thought Froome was aggressive without being assertive. I remember at the time thinking that this was a strange observation, at odds with my perception of him. Seven years later, I think it was completely misguided. It's the exact opposite. That cold blood is what's made him into the unquestioned leader he has become. Think of how deep into the 2018 tour, when he was being gapped on a summit finish, his first instinct was to reach for the radio and summon Egan Bernal back to ride for him, sometimes even at the expense of the man in yellow, Geraint Thomas. He was only doing what came naturally. Froome is a racing phenomenon, whose achievements grant him special status within the team and the peloton. It's for this reason that Ineos will give him everything that he needs for his long-shot, high-reward comeback. He will want for nothing in his quest. As Team Ineos DS Dario Cioni told me that morning in Gran Canaria, as we followed Froome on his long ride, we owe him that much. There's so much I don't understand about you, Chris, I say as we're heading towards some form of conclusion. I don't know where you get the mental resolve to go into battle again. He looks at me quizzically. I continue to develop an observation that had been germinating all day in my mind as I watched him train. It has to do with his status. In your generation of riders, you've seen off Contador, Nibali and Quintana. Those three guys will be remembered as three of the very best stage racers of their age. But at least at the Tour, you've basically seen them all off. Do you ever stop and think about that? He looks at me as if he's never before stopped and thought about that. Not really, no. Then he stops and thinks about it. It's funny hearing you say that now. But now, I continue, but now, he echoes, it's a whole, a whole new challenge. He completes my thought. It is. I don't want to spook you, but, I say, trying to spook him, and then he spooks himself. Just look at Jumbo Visma, for example. They're a bit serious, aren't they? I suggest. Yeah, he agrees. They should just chill out and stop taking it so seriously. He smiles. With sudden enthusiasm, he expounds upon the point. They're a huge challenge. They're probably going to be our biggest rivals this year. The margins are getting slimmer and slimmer. Everyone's training at altitude now. Everyone's working on the nutrition side. It's getting harder to find those gains on other people. I have one eye on my wristwatch. We've been chatting for a long time, and I'm conscious that Froome has done a seven-hour ride, been in physio for two hours, still hasn't eaten and needs to go back to physio after dinner. With the exception of his trusted wingman Mikhail Kwiatkowski and two members of the Ineos staff, he is training alone on the island. The rest of the team have flown away. He's left behind with all this way to catch up. We've returned to the notion of winning the Tour de France, which has taken Froome over entirely. His every thought, his every deed, his every waking moment. I've got the hope, the desire. I've got the motivation to do it. All the ingredients are there. I've got the support. I'm the one who needs to make it happen. But that's great. This is actually the side of cycling that I love. The commitment, the long hours, the dedication and single-mindedness that you need to win the Tour de France. This is what I'm going to get stuck into now. After his first victory in 2013, he was taken to lunch in Monaco in the company of Eddie Merckx. Froome, still largely unversed in cycling history, asked Eddie how many tours he'd won and had even been surprised by Merckx's response. Five seemed a lot. A lot has changed since then, of course. 
Froome understands his own context and his place in the record books. Now you know the significance of number five, don't you? I do. I do. I do. It's a big deal. Probably even bigger than number one. I'm so close. In a funny way, is it going to feel like your first? It's a completely new challenge. It feels like I'm starting from below zero. First I have to get back to zero again, then off I go. It's time for us to leave him alone, in his soulless hotel room surrounded by training kit drying on the backs of chairs, with no reminders of home, no frippery, no distractions. Our time together has felt, for me, like another deep dive into this ordinary-seeming man's exceptional psychology. I'm left with the urge to press fast forward to find out what will happen in July. Predictions are idiot things. Asking riders to make predictions is stupider still. That doesn't stop me from sitting forward in my chair and asking him to make one. Is it a fair question to ask you whether or not you'll think you'll win the Tour de France? I think I will, he replies without hesitation. That's a good answer, I tell him. There are many ways in which he could have avoided making this bold claim. He chose to decline them all. I will is not the same as I can. He accompanies me in the lift down to the lobby, asking me in a spirit of genuine curiosity about what's going on in my life. I feel that nothing I can say is of any particular interest. Then with a shake of a hand and a friendly nod, he thanks me for coming all this way. And with that, he lurches unevenly off for dinner and into his uncertain future. It's gone seven by now. You've been listening to Chris Froome and Seventh Seal by Ned Bolting from issue 20.3 of Rula, out now. Thank you for listening. I'm Andy McGrath, editor of Rula magazine. Independent journalism with unbeatable insight. For more of the best long-form cycling stories, individual issues, or to subscribe to the world's finest cycling magazine, go to ruler.cc.